morning. Can you all hear me okay? Is that loud enough? Yeah? Good, 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 good. I am. Um, question quickly before we start. Has anyone seen the film Shawshank Redemption? Can you not hear me? Can you hear, oh, can you hear me now? Better? Okay. I'll start again. I'm terrible with these things, aren't I? Look, I just... I feel like a pop star with it on. <laughs> a little bit like Madonna, but the... Um, <laughs> maybe that's the wrong word. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm probably safer with that, aren't I? Than um, one of these. I won't dance, I promise you. Right. Has anyone seen the film Shawshank Redemption? Okay, right, then we're in a good place. I'm, I, I, can, I can use my illustration, it's all right, because if you hadn't, we're starting on a bad foot. Okay, right, let me put it up. If you've seen this film or you haven't, the main character in it, and I had to try to learn his second name this morning, and let's see if we get it right, is Andy Dufresne. It's a French name. And if you know, he was wrongly convicted of murder, and he ends up with a life sentence in prison. Andy plans to escape. Okay? So he's, got, he's in a maxif, maximum security prison, and he wants to get out. He ain't staying in there, right? So he chooses to escape. And what he does is he gets this tiny, tiny rock hammer, and he makes a hole in his cell wall. And he eventually, over a long, long time, this hole gets big enough that he can climb through and escape. Now look, if you've seen the film, you'll know, Andy puts concrete and bits in his pockets, goes out into the courtyard, and just keeps throwing out the bottom of his trousers. And he does this for over 20, 20 years! 20 years the man does this. Now look, I reckon every single person in this room would agree with me that Andy was committed to his plan. Amen? <laughs> he was committed. And I bet most of you would agree with me that Andy was in this for the absolute long haul. Yeah? Right. Andy was there to stay. Well, he wasn't there to stay. He was trying to get out. But he's, like, he's, he's here to stay. He's not leaving, you know? He's going to be in this, isn't he, till the bitter end. He, that, I'm in this. I'm going to do this. I'm doing it, you know? You can count on me. Because you know what? I'm going to stick in. I am sticking into this. I am in it for the long haul. Now... I believe being in it for the long haul should be the way that we see building our relationship with others when we talk about Jesus. Amen? It should be about the long haul. We don't want to know, we don't want to be people that are here today and gone tomorrow. Yeah? We want to be committed to building loving, loving relationships with those in our community. I don't know about any of you, but I want to build genuine friendships with others. You know? I want to be able to walk with those and love people towards Jesus. I want to be known as someone who's in it for the long haul when I get to know someone in Costa. Yeah? I think it's so important that that's how we see it. You know, and as we come into this talk today, this is our final talk in this series, in our vision series, right? Right? I've loved this series, I really have. I've loved the idea of talking about how we love Jesus, love our community and make him know. I've got it up there so I can say it so many times. I, you know, if you can't remember it, just look to the right or look to your left. It is there, okay? But the truth is, we do want to be people that genuinely build relationships with others and get to know people. If you've been part of this series, if you've been with us week in, week out since January, you know, I looked, at the, I looked at the Great Commission, and I looked at the greatest commandments, you know, and we looked at it in depth back in January. Can you believe it's nearly March? It's nearly March already, right? And then Piang, didn't they, and Ellie, they taught us, didn't they, about community and hospitality, and they did an amazing job of telling us about those things. You know? And then I spoke about culture and generosity, you know, 
And I'm hoping one thing that you have got from these talks is how much this is an absolute impossible task. Because that's what we keep coming back to. This ain't about what we can do. It's about the power and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we want to be loving towards people in our community, or we want to be a group of people that learn to show hospitality, or if we want to be a people that have our doors open, hands and hearts open to show hospitality, or if we want to be more and more welcoming, then or be joyful in the way that we give, we must fix our eyes on Jesus. We must fix our eyes on Jesus and see our need for him and his grace in our lives. We must. And we must see our real need for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives if we want to see any type of transformation in the community. Amen? Amen. So today we are going to look at evangelism. I'm going to explain that a bit more later on. And we're going to consider some practical ideas by looking at the Great Commission and the Greatest Commandment. So we're going to look at it again, but we're looking at it slightly different. We're going to look more at the practical side of it. So if you want to open your Bibles at Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, that's where we're going to start. I've got a PowerPoint as well, then. So I'm going to read it. So this is Jesus speaking, speaking to his disciples. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to read that again because I love it. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today. Lord, I pray that you would speak into our hearts, our lives, into the future of Open Door Church more and more, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would have your way. We seek you, Lord, and we seek your way. In Jesus' name, amen. What is evangelism? I found this online. It's from Christianity.com. It says this, Evangelism, which is spreading the gospel, is important to Jesus. As the Bible tells us, Jesus came so that we may live. Jesus wants everyone to know this truth so they too can be part of God's holy kingdom. Okay? Now, Jesus wants us to share what he has accomplished with those who don't know him. That's what this is talking about. See, look, he calls, he, he calls us to tell them about his life. So he's talking, what this is saying is he's, we, we should go out and talk about his life, death, and his resurrection. And that only through him can them and us find salvation from sin and, eternal, and find eternal life. So this is really important. But I think what else is really important is we must remember, though, that we, as we chat about Jesus with people, it is the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus to them. Okay? For people to see their own brokenness, so if you want to use a more Christian word for it, if you want to see your sinful nature, they need God to reveal their lack of, their lack of dependency on him, and the rebellious hearts towards him. Okay? I said yesterday, there's no point throwing the word sin around. People, younger generations don't even know what it means. They're not interested in the word. If we don't choose to explain it a little bit, what's the point? Okay? So what I'm trying to do is instead of saying, we're all sinners and we need to stop, I'm trying to just put a bit of context to it because if we end up in, in this church... I'm hoping that we ended up in this church with lots of 20-year-olds and teenagers and people that may not know Christ. If we throw words around like sin, they're going to be like, what is he talking about? They've taken it out of the dictionary for youngsters. It's not a word they know. They're not interested in it. 
So we have to find a way to engage and talk about it for them to understand. So if they see that rebellion, if they see a sinful nature, if they see these things, they're going to understand if we unpack it a little bit more. Now, to see all this happen, we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I can stand here and talk about this, but it ain't about me. It's about what God does through us. Amen? Okay. See, if we think of the Bible, who convicts people? Jesus. The power of the empowerment of the Spirit. Not my judgment on you. Behave, Ollie. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that does it. See, I would suggest our job is to be servants. Servants to those people who, come, who we come across and to love them towards Jesus. We are called to serve. How do we serve? Walking, listening, guiding, talking, getting to know them. Getting to know people. What I don't think our role is, is to see people as a project. I really don't think that's what this is about. I don't think it's about how we persuade people or scare people into believing in Christ. Don't. When I first came to Christ, I was... <laughs> I prayed about this, how I put it. I, I rewrote it a few times. I was probably more leaning on the side of persuading people. Probably quite strongly. I'd probably end up in a few arguments if you didn't listen if I'm honest, and I'll probably come across a little bit too harsh. That's just being honest to myself, and they're things that I've prayed through, right? See, I was utterly determined that everyone needed to know Jesus. And I was going to tell them if you wanted to hear it or not, to be honest. Many of you would know as I came through a 12-step background from drug and alcohol addiction. So everyone was looking for a higher power of their own understanding, well, I'd found that higher power of their own understanding in Christ Jesus. So I ain't going to tell, I'm not, I don't, I'm telling you Jesus, it's Jesus, that's the end of it. But I had no switch off at all. If you didn't want to hear it, you're going to hear it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to bash you with my Bible type of thing. I, and the truth is, is there was some good in it because I was so passionate. I was so, so passionate. I don't know, not, not many of you know, and I don't share it very often. Well, I, 2011, 25th and 4th, 2011, I gave my life to Christ. I came to this church. So what are we now? Two, two, so, yeah, what, 14 years ago? 13 years ago? What's my maths like? Am I right? Yeah, around that. Oh, cool. My wife is here today because our, our daughter's gone away with my nan. And you, she shouted at me. She said twice she spoke to me since I've been standing here. Right, so it's 13 years. Right. I come to the, this church. I went to a small gathering of people that were talking about the Freedom in Christ course. I spoke to Peter and Amanda Humphrey about Jesus. I went home broken because I had just come off a great big binge of drinking drugs. And I got on my knees and I said, Lord, if you are real, I need your help. Now, what I don't share very often is at that time, I was pinned to the floor, speaking in tongues, and covered in sweat. My palms were sweat. I was dripping. You could drip my T-shirt. My T-shirt, you could wring it out. Right? It was really dramatic, and it was totally transforming. My mum, I was telling I was going to be a vicar in the morning. I didn't even really know what a vicar was. I said, that, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be a vicar. Everyone was like, what is he on? I was utterly passionate for Jesus. Some of what I did was had a good heart. But also, my heart was to persuade at times. I didn't know to switch off. And I, don't, I look back now, and I see that God's given me different ways to work. In work. He's worked in my heart. And shown me to approach people probably in a more loving way. To love people towards Jesus, not to see them as a project that I can tick off. Oh, there's another one I've spoken to. Another one I said, no, Wally, it ain't about that. It's about loving and serving people. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Right. The other one 
many of you are going to hear, I've, heard, I've, I've, used, this, I've used this before, so you, some of you would have heard it, is scaring people towards Jesus. Now, I went to Speaker's Corner. If you don't know what Speaker's Corner is, it's in Hyde Park, and it's where people talk from all different religions. They all talk about different faiths and different things, and they argue and bicker with each other. And I remember a guy standing up on a box here with his finger pointing at the crowd, talking about Jesus, and pointing and telling everyone, you are going to burn in hell. And I remember standing there as a new Christian, listening to him, thinking, listen to him waffle, like that. And I remember standing there thinking, and I watched this young lady, as she was walking past, had nothing to do with it, hearing him, with two twin, baby twins, break into tears and run up and grab a bit of paper off him. And I remember thinking, I will never, ever be like that. There can't be anything right with that. He utterly scared her. And I can't see that's how God calls us to genuinely get to know other people, make relationships and talk about him through scaring them. I just can't see it. You may have different perspectives on that, but me personally, I can't see that. So I don't think this is so much about persuading and bending people's arms, and I don't think it's about scaring people. And as I said to you, my approach has changed. And I'm more about approaching people through the lens of what Jesus said as he called us to love others. Now, this is what I think. And this is why we felt the strapline for Open Door Church had to be about fusing together the Great Commission and what Jesus taught about the greatest commandment. Bringing these two together. That's why if you look up there, they've got the verses on the different bits. Now, So we read in the Great Commission that Jesus tells his followers what? He tells them to go and reach others and tell them about him. So he says, go. And he tells his followers to go into other areas to teach them about him and to help those who come to know Jesus, to build up their faith and follow Jesus faithfully. He wants them to be faithfully committed and following. Yeah? And this is what he wants his, believe, his disciples to do. Go out and teach and go out and talk and do. What are they meant to do? They are meant to baptize those who make a commitment and become, who, and become followers of Christ. This is the mandate that Jesus handed to them. This baton Jesus passes to his followers, which has been passed down through history to other believers, right through the ages, and has been passed to this church today. It has. We're still waiting for Christ to return. So this is still part of the mandate. We are part of this story. And until he returns, until Jesus comes back, until King Jesus comes back, we are called to go. This is a huge part of the gospel. This should really be shaking and stirring everyone in this room. This is what we are called to do. Look, I long to see people come to know Jesus in Sunbury, in Feltham, in Up Halliford, in Hounslow, Hamworth and Hampton. I truly do. And to see them make a commitment to know him and to become part of the local church. I really want to see that. I long to see that more and more. I long to see regular baptisms here at Open Door Church. For us to worship King Jesus together. We know Jesus passed the baton on to his followers, and that includes us. And that should challenge gently our hearts. It should. But how should we approach others with this good news? How should we do it? Well, I think the answer is in the second part of Jesus' teaching on that greatest commandment that I've already said. I think it is that simple. What did Jesus say? Love your neighbor as yourself. You are called to love others. You are called to care. And this is what I feel we are called to do. Love people towards Jesus. 
that we are called to love those toward him. We're not called to see people as a project. We're called to see them as people created by God, people he wants us to care and to love. If we see a person as a project, we may see them as something that is disposable. If things don't go the way we think they should, scrap them. Move on to the next. That's not how God treated others. He calls us to walk with them, care for them, serve them. Over, like we spoke about with Shawshank Rejection, over the long haul. And this must come from our heart of love and our heart to serve others. First, we need to have, I would say, a genuine heart to make friends with people and a desire to get to know them. I think this is really important. I think for some people this just comes it's second nature. But actually for others it's not. You know? Many people today are looking for friendship that is genuine. Not shallow. Genuine friendship. They don't want it to be pretentious. They don't want it to be fake. They want people to be genuine and true. And actually truly care about them. And you can't do that if you're seeing everyone as a project. If we see it as a project, or how many people we can get through the doors of Open Door Church, that, that's not the right way. We have to be really genuine in the way that we do it. You must have a heart to serve and love others and to talk about Jesus and get to know people. That's what is important. That is why when they speak, when you have Piang and Ellie talking about hospitality and um, community and they keep talking about what they do in their homes you know I've got the next AJ fight coming up I'm going to get it and I'm going to invite as many people as they want to come round and watch it it's a good excuse for me to watch the boxing but it's also a good way to do fellowship you know and we need to be the same we need to generally want to get to know people have a great heart to know your neighbour. Have a great heart to know the man or woman in the, in the school playground. Have a great heart to know and to love and to serve. Yeah? So to do this, we need to build genuine friendships. I think that's what's important from today. We need to think about that. And we also need to have a desire to serve. I think that can be difficult, especially in today's climate. You know, we're all so busy. And I struggle with it, you know. Can you help me do that? Oh, I'm a bit busy at the moment. You know, you know, I'm not. I'm watching Netflix. But, you know, we do, don't we? It can be hard, the idea of helping and serving others. But to have a genuine heart to do that, a genuine heart that when we talk to people, I always remember working in a homeless night shelter where they were willing to wash feet. So the people that worked there, the volunteers, would wash the homeless people's feet and give them new socks. Now, I couldn't do it for other reasons. I just, it, I, for some reason, I tried, and I, it just, it, I couldn't personally do it. I found it quite difficult, yeah? And I think that's okay, so don't hit, hit me. Not that everyone's going to be able to wash feet, yeah? But some people were like, doesn't mean a thing to me, it's fine. And what was really big in that wasn't that they had warm socks and clean feet it was more the genuine love and the touch that someone they didn't know cared enough to wash feet and they were not Christians doing this this was run out of a church but it wasn't all everyone volunteering wasn't all Christians and most of the people I noticed that were washing the feet were non-Christians the actual Christians weren't doing it and I was it including me and I actually that really challenged my heart you know, it's actually challenged my heart as I talk it out publicly. But it, it's, there's a truth to that, isn't there? You know, they, they were happy to wash feet. They were happy to help in that way. Actually, everyone else was happy to cook, but no one wanted to be that hands-on. There's something really big about that. Because I was friends with lots of the homeless. I remember them saying it's more about someone seeing me as a human being. You know? That's a genuine step in faith, isn't it? To step out of your own comfort zone. That actually, at the time, it was a long time back, I, could, I struggled with. 
They are hands up. I found it hard. But other people do it. And what was strange about that, what was lovely at well, it was actually non-Christians that were more inclined to do it than actually the Christians in, who were, were serving and should know about more about the serving in this way. You know, it's in the Bible, isn't it? You know? And my last thing that I feel like we should do when we're looking at this is let God do the work. If there's one takeaway from this vision talk, it, like I've said over and over again, it's the understanding that we can't do this. It is God who does this, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that moves in us that does this, and we must lay that down. And when we look at all of these things, when we look at reaching our communities, when we look at reaching other people, we must see it the same. Let God do the work. Know our part. Our part is to serve, to love, to talk, to be genuine with people. But it's God, and we pray, don't we? If we truly believe that God works through prayer, then in every one of these conversations you can be praying as you're talking, in every one of these conversations you can go home and pray, can't you? If you truly believe that God does miracles, then we should be praying to see God do miracles in people's lives. You know, if you're out there talking to people and you want to see God move in their lives over the next couple of months, we should be praying, Lord, you're the God of miracles. Lord, do a miracle. Let me know my place. Let me serve. Let me love them. I'm going to finish this talk with... This is our last talk in the series. And I was praying about that this morning because we painted it on the wall like a tattoo, so it's going to stay, right? But it might be the last talk of the series, but it's the beginning of a new journey. Amen? What we don't want, and I... Because I do talk, I see it a lot, and I see it in myself. I can leave here, and I don't even... Chances are, sometimes I don't even know what I spoke about. By the time I get home, I'm thinking of something else, and it's really not... You know, you can ask me, and I'm like... I don't remember. I, I, I wrote it, but I don't remember. So I'm pretty sure if I feel that, most of us can feel that, right? Well, this is not that. These talks are the beginning of something. This is where we're going, and we are setting that landscape out. Yeah? So that's how I want to end today. This is not the end of the series. It's the beginning of a new thing. It's the beginning of what the journey we're on. Amen? Okay. I'm going to hand back to Asa, who's going to lead us in a response. Thank you.